Hello, good evening and welcome. And to those of you who attended the previous public meeting, welcome back. Now I trust you can hear me okay at the back. Can you understand me okay at the back? That's even better. I'd just like to get an idea of how many of you here this evening were not at the last public meeting, just to give me an idea of what I may or may not have to repeat. So if you were not at the last meeting, can you put your hands up? Oh, quite a few. Right, thanks for that. My name is Alistair Morrison and I'm currently the Chairman of the White Community Coast Community Board. And also here this evening we have my fellow Community Board members. Most of you will know Sonia Billiard, who is the community worker here in Waikawiki. Andy Barrett lives in Merton, just south of Karatani, and those who were here at the last meeting will remember Andy as microphone man, who ran around with the wireless mic, and he'll be doing that later on tonight. Geraldine Tate lives in Warrington. There's Geraldine down the front there. And Mark Brown lives in Waitati, and most of you know Mark from Blueskin Nurseries. Also from Waitati is Mandy Mayhem. Mandy Mayhem Bullock, actually, and the other member of our board is Councillor Jim O'Malley, who's hiding up the back there. And I've lived in the White Tatty area for about the last 36 years. And tonight, we're delighted to have sign language interpreters with us, and Bridie Strang is here to start with, and then Fiona Broad will be taking over about halfway through. Just before we start, a few housekeeping items. For those of you who may be unfamiliar with this, this wonderful building, the toilets are out the door there and over to your left. In the event of an emergency, there are exits up the back there and along the side here, and the mustering area is in the car park. We were asked if you have a mobile phone with you, can you either switch it off or put it on silent? As you come in this evening, we had COVID contact tracing sheets on the tables. And if you didn't fill them in as you entered, we would ask that you would do that as you leave. The recent events in Auckland demonstrated just how important contact tracing is. Alternatively, those of you who have mobile phones with the capability should have scanned the COVID QR codes, which are placed at many locations all around the building. And if you did not scan one on the way in, please do so as you leave. And just in case you don't know what QR stands for, quite simply, quick response. It's timely to make comment on the fact that there are very few countries in the world where gatherings like this can occur. Around 400 people in close vicinity of each other with no masks. And it's appropriate that we just take a minute to recognise the thousands of unsung people who make this possible. We have the flight crews and the aircraft, the ground staff at airports, the bus drivers who take the travellers to the quarantine facilities, the folk who staff those quarantine facilities, the people who carry out the mandatory COVID testing, and the people in the laboratories who analyse the COVID tests, and the people who carry out the contact tracing when COVID is detected. And we have the behind the scenes staff who coordinate all of this. And there are the well-known faces of Dr. Ashley Bloomfield and his team plus all those in government who play their part in this whole thing. And although they are not here in the evening, I think they deserve a big clap for all that they do. <laughs> and on the subject of testing, the last public meeting was on Friday the 5th of February. Saturday was Waitangi Day and it was Mondayized, so Monday the 8th was a public holiday. A number of the health services staff came along at the weekend to set up ready for the free blood testing that had been announced. And during the rest of the week, 1,326 blood tests were carried out here, and you'll be hearing about the results of these very shortly. On those four days, we had dozens of health professionals who'd come away from their usual daily jobs to carry out those tests in an extremely organized manner. And I think they deserve a big clap. Also on those four days, we had community board member Sonia Billiard and her team of volunteers. They handed out 749 packs of free fruit and vegetables, kindly provided by the Dunedin City Council when there was that short period of uncertainty about eating homegrown vegetables. And I think those fellows need a clap. And 
that'll do for the clapping now. Now, following the public announcement of the current water issue, the Dunedin City Council produced some high profile information on their website. And this has been updated daily since then. There is a link to update information on the testing of the water supply. And there are graphs there every day. There's also a link to what's called FAQs, or Frequently Asked Questions. And there are around 30 questions and answers there at the moment, and they grow each day as people ask questions, the answers are put up there. There's also a link to the Southern District Health Board website, and there you can find a lot of really interesting information as well. Now, I realise an awful lot of folk don't have computers, and are not familiar with websites or even what they mean. But I'd just like to get an idea of how many of you are actually accessing these websites. If you just put your hand up, please. That would be about, about half of you, I would say. Maybe just a shady under a half. Thanks very much. You'll notice today we've got the, the media are present. We've got radio, television and the newspapers. And I can let the media people here know that at the conclusion of this meeting, there will be an opportunity for you to have a chat with council and health services staff in the John Brown room, which is just across the foyer over in the corner there. As you come here this evening, I imagine that you're keen to find out three main things. First, the state of your physical health in relation to drinking water. Secondly, how much longer will the current situation last? with having to travel to tanks to collect your drinking and cooking water in plastic containers? And thirdly, when will you get some nice water that doesn't taste like poo? As someone remarked last time, although he used a slightly different word, but it did mean the same thing. Our speakers this evening will provide the answers to these questions. And they will be joined by a panel of experts and council representatives to answer any further questions you may have. We'll have the presentations first, and the questions will follow that. Throughout the evening, Sonia Billiard over here and Melissa from the Health Board over here will be taking notes so that we can follow up on any issues that arise. Just going to cover off a, very quickly a few questions that were raised at the last public meeting. We were asked if we could have someone from MPI here this evening to comment on the potential effect of lead in water on stock animals and pets, and also on homegrown vegetables? And the answer to that is yes, and you will meet that gentleman in just a wee while. We were also asked if we could have someone who could provide specialist knowledge about how lead in water could impact the relationship between mothers and babies. And the answer to that is also yes, and you will meet her shortly. A number of people who live in Karatani asked if Dunedin City Council would consider draining and refilling household water tanks with clean water once the tap water ban is lifted? And the answer to that is yes. The council will do that and they will provide details to all households closer to the time when it's going to happen. We were also asked by a gentleman if the DCC had contacted WorkSafe in relation to the current water quality issue. The answer to that is yes, they have. And other questions will be answered as we proceed this evening. We have a large number of very qualified people here this evening, some of whom have travelled from afar to be with us. And they will be on the panel here to answer questions later on. We have Dr Susan Jack, the Medical Officer of Health and Clinical Director, and you will be hearing from Susan very, very shortly. Dr Michael Butcher is also a Medical Officer of Health, We've got Dr. Gloria Dainty, Department of Women's and Children's Health, and Dr. Adam Pomerlo, Director of the Poison Centre, a medical toxicologist and emergency medicine specialist. And if you ever thought that maybe one place to have an occasion when you don't feel too well, what would be tonight with all these doctors here? We've also got Dr. Andrew Pearson, who's the Manager of Food Risk Assessment from the Ministry of Primary Industries. From Dunedin City Council, we've got the Mayor, Aaron Hawkins, Chief Executive, Sandy Graham, Tom Matt Dyer, who's the manager of Three Waters. And if you're wondering what Three Waters means, it means drinking water, waste water, and storm water, of which there was plenty this afternoon. We've also got Simon Drew, who's the General Manager of Infrastructure. 
From the Regional Council, we've got Andrew Newton, Chairman, and we've got Richard Saunders, who's the Manager of Compliance. So I'm just going to now welcome Susan Jack to come up and uh, speak to you about all the, the findings from the blood tests that were taken just a few weeks ago. Thanks very much, Alistair, and welcome to you all this evening. Um, so Alistair has already introduced um, me, Dr. Susan Jack, so I'm the Medical Officer of Health and Clinical Director, and the other people have already been introduced to you as well. Just like to acknowledge Chris Fleming, the Chief Executive of the Southern District Health Board, who's with us this evening as well. Um, so as we went about gathering your blood lead level results and the questionnaires, we had a couple of analysts and I just want to do a special shout out to Dr. Andy Engelmeyer who spent hours and hours poring over and analysing the data. We also gathered together an expert advisory group to help us interpret the results. Um, these people were from the Ministry of Health, from Massey University, Otago University, Environmental Science and Research Institute and the National Poison Centre. So a, a special thanks to them also. So what I'm going to do uh, this evening is to share initially the key findings because I know that's what you're all here to um, hear about. And then we're going to go back to look at the purpose of taking the blood lead levels a little bit about how many people in your communities were involved, and then go into more of the details um, on the findings for adults and children. A little bit about comparing with New Zealand national surveys, some changes over time, and then finish with some conclusions and next steps. So the main findings, I'm going to start with the key findings from the blood test. Um, but first, I really want to acknowledge the worry and level of concern of people in your communities. And this was really reflected by the huge number of people that came to get tested. And we're really grateful for you. The fact that so many of you came forward means that we can get a really good look at what was going on. And then, like I said, following these key findings, we'll go through what they mean in detail for you as an individual and for you as a community. Now I know that you will have questions, but I'd like to ask you to note them down and after the presentations you'll get an opportunity to ask them. So as we said right from the outset at the last meeting, we do expect and we did expect to see low but detectable levels of lead in your community, just as we would in any community in New Zealand. And this is due to just a range of lifestyle and environmental factors. So what we found in your communities was that no one had a blood lead level that needed hospitalisation or treatment. So no one had very, very high levels and that was very good news. There were, were very few blood lead levels that were above the new threshold and I'll be explaining more about that threshold but it's 0.24 micromoles per litre in your blood results. So that was also reassuring. Among adults, the blood lead levels in your community were not substantially higher than expected when we compare them to national New Zealand, New Zealand survey data. Now, New Zealand data is quite limited and we're basing our com comparisons on a national study that was conducted 2014 to 2016, and that's the most recent New Zealand data that we have available. For children, we can't tell if blood lead levels in children are slightly higher than expected, although almost all levels were well below the new threshold. So again, that's reassuring. There may be some reasons for a slight elevation, and this includes seasonality, because in summer, lead levels in children um, go up, and I'll talk about this a little bit later on. 
There was no evidence of a difference between those who only drank the local water compared to those who did not, and I'll be explaining that a little bit further on as well. So to summarise, the blood lead levels are generally below notifiable levels and in line with nationally representative data. The national survey was conducted across New Zealand, the North Island and the South Island, and it is nationally representative. It appears that long-term exposure to lead from the water supply is unlikely. What we are still doing though is advising residents, you not to drink the water while the investigation into the cause of the elevated lead readings is ongoing. Okay, so now if we go back to the purpose of the blood test. So we, like you, were concerned that exposure to these inter intermittent spikes of lead in the water may have been going on longer than the six months of testing. So the first purpose of the blood testing was for individuals to know your own blood results and look at risk factors and understand your own risk factors for lead exposure. The second purpose was to look at the blood lead levels for the whole community. Um, the whole community that had the same water supply so that's people living in Wakawaiti, Karatane and Hawkesbury Village. And to see if collectively the blood lead levels were any higher than expected by comparing your data to the National New Zealand Survey. And thirdly, we wanted to see if blood lead levels were in any way related to drinking the water from the local supply. So those intermittent spikes that we've talked about. So like Alistair said, there was a huge response um, from the community, 1,326 from those pop-up clinics, a further 186 from GP practices. So the total was over 1,500, which is a huge number. Most people did fill in the questionnaires. Some children had a finger or heel prick test. And we gave that option because it's easier and less painful for children but we do need to point out that it is a screening test. If a child had a result higher than the threshold of 0.24 micromoles per litre, we invited those children to have a venous blood sample test, and all of them uh, did, and I'll explain that in a minute, to check. The venous blood sample is the gold standard. So when we came to the detailed analysis, when we were linking um, the venous blood in the survey, we needed to have a matching pairs, so a matching venous blood sample with a fully completed survey. And when we did that, we had uh, almost 1,200 that we can use. That also is a good number, and um, some surveys are still coming in, and they will be in included in a final report. But certainly this evening, we have more than enough to give us some answers. So when we look at the number who participated and compared against the estimated population using the 2018 census data, we do believe that the people that came forward for testing do really well represent the expected number in your community. So the census data is in the blue bars, and the orange bars is the number of you that were tested this is just looking at the venous samples in each age group. Altogether, we estimate that 88% of your communities came forward for blood testing, and around 74% were able to be included by having a venous blood sample and a fully completed questionnaire. And this really gives great representation of the community and gives us confidence in the results and what they mean. Okay, now this is what we call a scatter graph. And each blue dot represents someone who had their blood checked in your communities from the venous samples. Um, there are two results from children that we've removed, and I'll be talking about them in a minute. Across the bottom, you've got the age, and up on the, the y-axis, we've got the um, blood lead levels in micromoles per litre, which is what we use in New Zealand, but alongside that it's also reported in micrograms per decilitre, 
because many of the international publications use that. The yellow dotted line across there is the new threshold and we're really happy to announce that the Ministry of Health is going to bring this in to be the new level um, from the 9th of April this year. So that's the 0.24 micromoles per litre. Up until the 9th of April, um, the current um, level, the current threshold is 0.48 micromoles per litre. So that's the red dashed line across the top. So what you can see, I hope, is that most people are below the new threshold. There's a small number that were above the threshold, um, only one adult that was above the old threshold. Um, and what you can also see is that red solid line is the average um, by age. So what we've got is most people are well below that new threshold, a, a small number above the, the new one. Blood lead levels, as people get older, um, the blood lead level tends to be higher. And this is because for older people, um, exposure has been for longer. And for some people, as we get older, our bone bones might start to um, lose something. We might have osteoporosis or thinning of our bones. And lead is stored in our bones, and when that happens, some lead is released into our blood, and so the levels would go up um, as we get older. These patterns are what we see in many other countries. So other high-income countries where they've done a lot of testing of blood lead levels see the same pattern. Another thing you might notice is there's a slight curve upwards for the very young children and this again is very typical of what is seen internationally. Young children absorb lead more than adults, so the same amount of lead a child is going to and baby is going to absorb that more. Um, it's through because of their smaller body size, also through their normal behaviours of tending to want to put lots of things in their mouths all the time. Again, this pattern is completely normal. And this is just to highlight that. This is data from the United States, where they, every two or three years, they do a blood lead level survey across their population. And what you can see here is different years. I'm not sure if you can see that very easily. So the top line there is from 1999. And then as the years have gone down, this latest data that they've reported is 2015 to 16 their blood lead levels have declined. So this is a 17 year period, and you can see that every year, every couple of years when they measure it, the blood lead level has declined. Um, and that's for a number of reasons that we'll also talk about in a minute. Okay, so we're going to um, start with children. Children, as I've said, are more vulnerable to lead exposure. They do absorb more proportionally than adults. And so we do especially want to see what their results tell us. The blood testing done among your young children, especially the ones aged under five, is the first recent survey in New Zealand. The national survey that was done 2014 to 16 did not include under fives, so we don't have any recent data to compare your under fives with. For children aged 10 to 17 years, um, your blood lead levels were very similar to the previous national survey of the same age. For children aged 5 to 9, the blood lead levels were slightly higher than the previous national survey, but still, as I've said, well below the new threshold. And as we showed before, the youngest children have the higher results, um, and so that is to be expected and is the pattern around the world. As is also the pattern around the world, males have a higher level than females. So, as I said, one of the reasons why the levels on average for the younger children might be higher is seasonality. So international studies have shown that for children, blood lead levels increase in summer. Children are often playing outdoors, they're playing in dust, they're playing in dirt, and perhaps pick up the lead that way. So when we did the blood testing here, it was towards the end of summer, 
And so that could be a possible explanation. At the blood lead levels that we have seen for children, the vast majority of have levels that do not raise concerns. At these low levels, they certainly do give an indication that children are being exposed to lead um, in their environment, but there is likely to be very little impact on their health and development. But what I do want to stress is that if people have concerns about your child, about yourself, please do visit your GPs and discuss those and have a full assessment. Okay, so a few more details about the children. There were six children that when they had a finger prick or heel prick test, their levels did come back above the new threshold. All of these children went on to have a repeat venous sample and all of them were offered an assessment by the paediatricians at the Dunedin Hospital. On retesting, two children had levels above the new threshold of 0.024. One of those had a very strong reason for having a higher blood lead level other than drinking the water and the other we are still in the process of investigating but both these children will be followed up and monitored by a paediatrician. When we linked the questionnaire information with the blood lead levels, we found that there are some factors that are, are linked with having a ten tendency or a trend towards higher blood lead levels. So not necessarily above the threshold, but just increased blood lead levels compared to the average for their age. So for children, the important things that came out were living in an old house, especially those built pre-1945, and living in a house with flaky or peeling paint, or that were undergoing renovations. So those were the particular risk factors that we found in your community for the, um, for the children. Okay, so what did we find for adults? When we compared your community blood lead levels with the New Zealand National Survey, the levels were very similar. And as we said from the outset, we expected to see low but detectable levels um, of lead in your community due to that range of lifestyle or other environmental factors. As across the world, uh, your males have higher levels than the females. And just as you saw, blood lead levels are higher in older age groups with higher levels or highest levels in those aged 65 years and older. So we've already explained and talked about osteoporosis and bones and also because people have just been more exposed over their life, lifetime, so there has been an accumulation. There were no differences between Māori and non-Māori in your communities for blood lead levels. Okay, so for adults, we found there were 36 adults that had blood lead levels above the new threshold, one that was above the 0.48, so the, the previous threshold, almost previous threshold. Um, this was to be expected, and if we took blood from a thousand people in any community in New Zealand, we would expect results very similar to this. We have done investigation, further investigations with any individuals who had these levels above the 0.24, um, and all of them to date seem to have a likely reason for this other than drinking the local water. Um, we are investigating a uh, some of them to get some more details on this. So for a lot of people it was a clear link between hobbies or work related or home renovation related um, or simply having older age. But we're going to continue looking and working with these people um, and especially if anyone has concerns we'll be working with you. So when we linked the questionnaire data to the blood levels, similarly to as we did for the children, the factors that were important for adults in your community were being male, um, eating shellfish, drinking roof water, living in or regularly visiting a house with peeling paint or renovations, having a risky job, and this was self-reported and included things like working in a mine or previously working in a mine, 
working with cars in ship or boat building. So for males, the particular risk factors were age, shipbuilding, a high-risk job, and working with cars. And for female adults, the particular risk factors were again age, eating shellfish, and a self-reported high-risk job. Okay, so here is that same scatter graph that we showed earlier, but this time it's plotted on top of the New Zealand survey data. The yellow dots are your blood lead levels and the blue dots are from the New Zealand survey. And the solid lines that you can see there in yellow and blue are the averages for the ages. And you can see that most of the time those solid lines fall on top of each other, meaning that there's no difference between what we found in your blood lead levels and the national survey. You can see for um, the children here, there's a slight difference. The blue line here is the national survey and the yellow line is um, your blood results. And I've talked a little bit that it could be seasonality, it could be a smaller sample size. There's a number of reasons that we're exploring. Okay, and this slide is just to put into some of the context, the time trend of some of the interventions that we've done in New Zealand to reduce our exposure to lead. So in the mid-70s, they introduced lead-free solder for baby food cans and for carbonated beverage cans. In the late 70s, white lead was no longer allowed to be used in paint. In the mid-80s, the content of lead in all paint was further restricted. In the mid-80s, they started the phase out of lead from gasoline or petrol in New Zealand. And then by the mid-90s, they completed the phase out. So you could no, no longer buy uh, petrol that had lead in it. So these, overall, you can see, um, it's a little bit hard to see, I do agree. So, the round um, circles are adults and the triangles represent children. And these are from various studies that have been done in Christchurch and Dunedin. The blue one is from the National uh, Survey 2014-16 and your results are here in red. These grey ones are some data from the United States. And as I said, they do very regular um, blood lead level checking across their whole population. This is the old historical notifiable level for lead. So it was way up at 0.72, then it was dropped to 0.48, and um, in a couple of weeks' time, it's going to be 0.24. And what you can see is this quite marked decline. So in the 1980s, um, the blood lead levels, average blood lead levels in children were about 10 times what they are today. So that's just a put some context in there. What we can see is that our results here um, and the New Zealand survey are slightly above what the US is able, has been able to achieve. And they've put a number of measures in the US and we can talk about um, some of those and how we might be able to do that in New Zealand as well. So what factors were not linked with higher blood lead levels in your communities? This is what we call a heat map, um, and it's looking at the blood lead level results. So going from low levels to higher levels. So the whitish, the paler the yellow, the lighter, um, the lower the level, and the darker, the higher. But the point of this is just to show that there was no consistent pattern. So here we've got Wakawaiti, here's the golf club down here, here's Edinburgh Street, here's Karatani, and here's um, Hawkesbury Village. They were all similar. We don't have a distinct pattern to say in one particular part of the reticulation system we've got people with high blood lead levels. So that also provides some reassurance. How about if you only drank the local water? And again, when we were just starting out with the survey, some of us told us that um, your water here did not taste great. And Alistair and others have described that better than I can and that some people never drank the water at all. 
So we added a question asking about that to see if there was any difference between those who only drank the local water compared to those who didn't. Actually about 70% of you reported that you do in fact drink the water. Um, but we did not find any evidence of a difference, not for adults and not for children, for those who drank the water su local supply compared to those who didn't. So again, this is reassuring. There are some limitations to this analysis. Um, the numbers, especially for children, were small, and there was quite a lot of missing data, both in adults and in children, for this question. But as much as we were able to take from the analysis, there was no evidence of a difference. So the third purpose of taking the blood lead levels was to answer the question, did the intermittent spikes in lead in the water supply have any impact on the blood lead levels? So overall, we didn't find an effect for adults and for the children over 10 years old. For younger children, we don't know if there was a very small effect from drinking the water in the young children. As I said, young children absorb more lead than older children and adults, and so they would be the first to show if there was an increased lead level in their blood due to the water or from any other exposure. And like I also said, unfortunately, we don't have any national New Zealand data to compare the under fives with. So while the results of your very young children are well below the threshold on the whole, which is very reassuring, we just cannot tell if they are slightly higher than what they might have been without the lead spikes in the water. We did find from linking the survey to the blood lead levels that exposures other than water were much more important. So these included for children, as you saw, living in a house with peeling paint or being renovated, and for adults, work or hobbies or house renovations. And in addition, like I mentioned, seasonality may have impacted our results, for, um, especially for the young children. So the risk of drinking the water has been stopped and we are working very closely with the council to ensure that going forward there will be no further risk from the water supply and the DCC will be explaining that in a moment. So in summary, some adults in a very small number, two children, had blood lead levels above the new threshold. These people have all had individual assessments by our public health staff that for some included home visits and testing of paint and dust and soil and we're still awaiting most of those results. These people have been or will be given specific advice on how to reduce their risk of exposure in their environments. The vast majority of people had levels well below the new threshold. For children who had a finger or heel prick test that was below the threshold, there's no need to repeat this. However, if families are concerned, you can go to your GP and ask for a venous blood sample to be taken. The finger prick or heel prick test is likely to give higher results as there may be contamination from dust on the skin. And what if you are still concerned? For example, what if your result doesn't reach the threshold, but it's higher than what you expected or higher than what you think you can explain? We do encourage you to read the information on the websites, the frequently asked questions. Um, we've got some leaflets with information on it also. Um, but if you still have some health concerns, we do encourage you to go and see your uh, GP and discuss it with them and have a full assessment. So the experience in your communities has really helped to shine a light on our overall lead exposure in New Zealand. So for your communities, and indeed nationwide, this may be due to several exposures. So these include older pipes in our water retic reticulation networks, or that we Kiwis love doing a bit of home renovation. 
or that we live in houses with old lead paint, or that some of our tapware, even brand new taps, may contain some lead, as the current standards for um, bringing these into New Zealand is still only voluntary. Or we may have old lead paint chips in the soil in our garden. Or we may be collecting rainwater off our roof, and these may have lead uh, fixtures like lead head nails still on them. So this is really an opportunity for us and for New Zealand to be aware of the risks. And addressing these risks is probably the most important thing that we can do to impact our own individual blood lead levels. So these messages are for you in Makawaiti, Karatane and Hawkesbury Village, but also apply across New Zealand. We need to be careful when we're doing our home renovation. We need to strip paint safely. We need to be careful and take protection when we're sanding old paint. We need to fix our old houses if they have chipped or peeling paint and vacuum regularly to decrease dust, wet, wet dust, floors and ledges and window sills and other flat surfaces. This is especially so if we have young children in our houses. Um, because like I said, they, they pick up dust and they absorb lead a lot more than we do as adults. Another big thing that we get reminded about a couple of times a year, but I never do myself, and it's a lesson for me as well. We need to get into the habit of flushing our taps every morning. Only needs to be like a couple of mugfuls, but as I said, some of our tap fittings may have lead in, so the water's just sitting there overnight. Just let that first lot flush away before you get it to make your cup of tea in the morning. The council is working hard on looking at piping that may have lead joints, and they'll be explaining that in a minute as well. And then just the usual messages that you've heard about through COVID, but washing your hands, especially before eating, especially young children if they've been playing outside, discouraging children from eating dirt, washing dummies and toys frequently, especially if they're used outside. And checking if you do use roof water that your roof doesn't have lead head nails if you're collecting that for drinking water. So health providers will continue to provide care for individuals and advice around environmental lead exposures to you and your community. Like I said, if you still have individual health concerns, please go to your GP. And Public Health South will continue to work with the Dunedin City Council to ensure water is completely safe before allowing you to use it again for drinking. So the final thing is we just want you to continue to get your drinking water from the tanks until we are completely satisfied that the water in your community is completely safe to drink. Thank you. I'm just going to ask the Mayor of Dunedin, Mr. Aaron Hawkins, to come up now and he's going to say a few words. Thanks, uh, Elsa, for your introduction and again uh, for your assistance in putting this event together. I'd like to acknowledge uh, my uh, numerous uh, council colleagues who are here this evening as they were uh, at the previous uh, public meeting we held, which uh, gives you an indication of how seriously uh, this issue is being taken uh, around, around the council table. And I want to echo uh, Susan's thanks uh, to everyone who turned up uh, and had their blood tested and uh, filled in the survey. It was incredibly important to be able to get a significant uh, sample size to get as, as good a, a profile uh, of the community uh, as possible and I think uh, that we've been able to do that. Uh, this has been uh, and still is uh, a very uh, difficult time uh, for our community and I know uh, people have been worried uh, and upset and that is entirely understandable. Uh, the health and welfare of our residents has always been our number one concern. 
uh, and working in partnership with Public Health South, we're doing everything that we can uh, to look after you and your families and get to the bottom of the elevated lead readings. I do want to thank uh, a few people. I want to thank uh, everyone who has helped uh, the Waikawaiti, Karatane and Hawkesbury Village uh, communities in recent weeks, uh, including uh, the community board, uh, local businesses, health professionals, uh, the DHB and DCC staff. Uh, a big thank you to the locals who helped us as we brought in water tankers and put up with the disruption uh, as we carried out that work. This is a very complex issue uh, and we may never have all of the answers as to why this has happened. Uh, however, uh, the Dunedin City Council uh, and residents from across the city are behind you and we will continue to work and do what we can to support you uh, and thank you for your patience uh, and for your understanding uh, as we undertake this work. And it's, um, I will now like to bring up uh, Tom Dyer, who's our group manager of Three Waters, who can talk through the work that we are currently doing in terms of trying to figure out what's going on uh, and getting on top of the issue as it stands. Tom. Thank you for the introduction, Aaron, and um, uh, thank you all for having us here tonight. Um, I'd just like to echo the thanks that have been iterated so far, and I'd also like to um, quickly acknowledge the community and the community board. So the community board have been um, phenomenal in terms of um, a, a vehicle for communicating with you all and for, um, for us as staff to understand how you are all um, dealing with these things and how our information is given to you uh, and or not in some cases, which has been vital in terms of learning on the way through. The other thing I'd like to thank you for is um, your patience, understanding and goodwill. Um, the, that was truly evident when we took a, undertook a door knock the day after our announcement. Um, my staff and other staff who did that work remarked at the level of positivity and um, resilience shown by your community. Uh, so today uh, we'll give you an update on our investigation to date, um, how, how we've found ourselves in this position, um, what we understand and what we don't yet understand, uh, the water testing process, um, our, what our um, next steps will be both in regard to Edinburgh Street pipe work, which I'll talk about in a bit of detail, and, um, and our uh, further next steps. So. We, as soon as the do not drink notice was issued, we started additional sampling and monitoring. Um, so we, we were undertaking weekly tests. Uh, we undertook to, to take those tests daily. We also broadened our sample set. So we were sampling at more locations across the network to try and get a better understanding of how frequent um, any lead spikes or lead, um, lead high lead readings were and to get an understanding of how widespread they were. So, uh, would it be good if we could take questions at the end of the presentation? I can explain that further in a second if you'd like. So, we installed a number of new um, a number of new sampling taps. Um, we also undertook a whole bunch of analysis at our, on our treatment plant. So, looking at um, uh, pH, conductivity trends, all of the things, all of the water quality metrics that are important um, to our treatment plant process in terms of um, uh, providing safe drinking water day to day. We, we also installed an auto sampler um, uh, to test the river for lead. So this auto sampler takes uh, two hourly tests. Um, those tests give us a much better snapshot of exactly what's going, in the going on in the river um, in a, on a more momentary basis rather than those daily tests. The, the review, um, so we've also reviewed a whole range of sites. Um, those sites were largely led by you as the community, so we got a lot of feedback uh, regarding possible sources of lead in the catchment. Um, we've looked at Cherry Farm Landfill, um, at Edinburgh Street Landfill, uh, fly tips um, in the river catchment and around the area um, and we've looked at lead shot in the catchment as well as another potential source um, and we've also been looking at sampling on analytical error. Um, 
a lot of these things are um, difficult to rule out in isolation, but we've, we've undertaken to do that. The, so we've, we've also undertaken quite a um, detailed look at the, the catchment, and that includes looking at all of those sites I mentioned before. Um, so, and we've undertaken this with, um, with a consultant, Tonkin and Taylor, who are a specialist in this space. We've looked at a huge range of potential contamination sources in the network and we've found no evidence so far of sustained elevated discharges of lead within the river catchment. A number of potential sources have been considered in detail um, and some are still being investigated. The, so we'll move on now to the water testing and I'll, and I'll hopefully answer um, the gentleman's question before. Um, so this graph shows all of our test results from uh, 192 Main Road, uh, which is just, just across the road here. Um, originally we were sampling from the Golden Fleece Tavern, um, but we, on the, um, just after the, um, the Do Not Drink notice was issued, we, we undertook to install a purpose sampling tap, which is a dedicated sampling tap site, um, which we, we do to try and ensure that any sampling error or possibility of sampling error is minimised. Um, that was undertaken on, a, on at the start of February, um, and as you can see from the results from February 1st, um, we've had very few results since. This graph shows uh, the 210 Edinburgh Street site, which is where the golf course is, for those of you that are not familiar. Um, Again, so this, this site has been our most active in terms of uh, readings. These, and some of these readings have been quite exceptional. The, as you can see, up until, uh, up until February 1st, or around the time of issuing the Do Not Drink Notice, we were getting quite regular readings, um, and those were all taken from sample taps within the golf course. Um, however, those, those readings have all but um, all but gone. Now we've had a, a, only a few, a handful since. There's two important changes um, at this site. One is installation of that for the purpose sampling tap. The other is uh, that we have a, uh, started flushing more regularly with this particular site. So the reason for that is um, we were also noticing a lower chlorine residual, um, which we used to uh, ensure that there's no bugs in the network. Um, we noticed a lower chlorine residual at the end of Edinburgh Street and we needed to get the turnover of that pipe up a little bit um, so we think that potentially helps to reduce those, those levels. We are fairly confident that a lot of the high readings um, in Edinburgh Street have been caused by uh, older metallic pipe work. Um, so there's about six and a half kilometres of uh, cast iron pipe work which, well, that was installed in 1912 in the Edinburgh Street area. Um, that still remains in service and that has lead jointing and other lead fittings um, at on or about the service line point. In Karatani, um, it's a similar picture to, to the uh, 112 main road site uh, except for one significant reading on the 8th of December. So if I go back to the Edinburgh Street site, you can also see a significant reading on the 8th of December. Those are important as it's really hard to explain two high readings and two uh, what are essentially opposite ends of the network uh, on the same day. And those, those things at the moment we are, we are still struggling to, um, to work out exactly what might have caused that and we indeed, as the Minister said before, we may never know. So we've also been testing our raw water reservoir, which is um, a large concrete tank at the treatment plant um, that we put water into. Uh, we pump water out of the river and, and place it in the tank. Uh, we take it from the tank to then treat. Um, so we've been testing fairly regularly there, um, and, and indeed daily since uh, since the do not drink notice. The we have had one high reading there um, on the 20th of January and indeed that was the, that was um, as uh, Dr Jack described it, the game changer for us um, in terms of issuing the do not drink notice. 
um, this was what we saw as confirmation that um, there was a chance that we were getting these intermittent spikes um, potentially from the catchment um, and then moving through the entire network. So I'll just talk you through the uh, testing process. We, we undertake two tests when testing for metals. Um, one is called a, a pre-flush test um, and the second is a post-flush post test. Um, the reason for this is, um, is twofold. So typically, um, typically it is common that your tap fittings uh, have a level of lead in them um, and different chemical properties or different chemistry uh, chemical properties within the water can result in different levels of lead uptake. Um, so we test for that reason um, to understand how aggressive the water is and how much um, how, how great the volume of uh, metals that might be, metals are that might be stripped out of uh, any tap wear. We also test um, to determine any significant difference between uh, the effect on tap wear and internal plumbing and the broader network. Um, so typically our pre-flush results have been quite variable. Um, so when you look at the pre-flush results and try and overlay them uh, across our post-flush results, there isn't much of a story to be told and it's hard to do hard to gain a clear understanding of where these results might be coming from. Um, so typically we've been publishing our post-flush results. The post-flush results are representative of the water that is delivered to your boundary typically. All of the graph results that I've provided before are post-flush um, and the pre-flush results uh, um, typically we've, we've left off of our graphs today but we're, we're willing to have, absolutely happy to share those. Um, they do show an erratic level of lead and we have seen some higher readings in those, in those results. So on the pre-flush and post-flush um, analysis, because we've seen those high levels of, of lead in the pre-flush results, it really demonstrates the, um, uh, the importance of flushing taps when you when you start um, your day or before you drink any water from them. Um, as Dr. Jack remarked before, um, uh, tap wear within New Zealand um, typically does contain lead, um, and uh, and that lead is available to be to be leached into the um, into the water within the taps. If you turn your tap on for a, for a short while and enable it to run to the drain, um, you can then. Uh, you can then safely drink it afterwards, typically. We do provide this information um, reasonably, uh, or on, periodically, through our FYI um, uh, yeah. pamphlet, but um, we will uh, work to ensure that, that that's shared far more widely and, and actively. So, in, on, in terms of the current situation, um, so we, we're working really closely with the community board to understand how things are going within your community. We're also working really closely with um, uh, with members of the community and looking to take feedback where possible on on how things are working. Um, we've provided water tanks at a whole bunch of locations. Um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with all of those now. Um, and we've provided containers to the collection of the water. Um, there are still a lot of containers available and if you're running short on them, just please get in touch and we can, we can make sure that you get, get some more. Um, and we're also, for people that are um, unable to collect their own water, we're providing home deliveries to make sure that, um, that there's uh, minimal barriers to, to people that are unable to get that water. We're also providing um, 1,000 litre tanks for a number of local businesses, um, trying to ensure that they have as, as much water as they need to continue operating their businesses um, and trying to minimise the impact of the current situation. Our, Test results um, are being communicated on the website, um, uh, as uh, LSB noted before. We're working really closely with a range of entities, the Public Health South, the LRC, um, and the University, on to, to really understand why there are elevated lead readings. Um, that is um, that is proven fruitful and, and, and certainly helping us to move forward as quickly as possible. I particularly want to acknowledge the, um, the university and that, and that they've um, volunteered the services of um, some of their lab staff to, to ensure that all of the um, test results we're seeking are turned around in a really timely fashion. 
Uh, additional monitoring equipment um, has also been installed, so we've looked to um, procure uh, sampling equipment from Belgium that will provide a um, very regular lead reading that should enable us um, to potentially, um, potentially take further action in the future. We've also, we've also confirmed the presence of lead joints, as I mentioned before, um, in a number of areas of the pipe work, so largely in Edinburgh Street. Um, there is one other short section of pipe and, uh, at the far end, down by Stewart Street, at the far end of the town here. So, in terms of Edinburgh Street, um, we've, we've looked at that pipe work and, and recognised that the, there is a risk that that pipe work is contributing to the, those elevated tests in, um, in Edinburgh Street and we're looking to replace that as quickly as possible. Um, so work commenced on the 15th of January to start planning that and engaging contractors to do that work. Um, uh, for any of you that live over there, you may have noticed that we've, we've started welding um, sections of pipe together to, to get them ready to lay on the ground. So approximately um, six and a half kilometres of that pipe um, needs to be replaced. It's going to cost roughly six million dollars. Um, and we're working to do that as quickly as possible. It's important to note that that work was already in the um, the 10 year plan and we've been able to rephase that and, and get on with it quite quickly. Um, we're expecting to get the work done around June um, 2021. It is quite a significant undertaking. Uh, in terms of next steps, um, the source of, of that, those intermittent spikes, those short, sharp, um, really high results um, are still not known, um, but we're working to continue that investigation. Um, we, we are fairly confident that the, um, those background levels of lead that were shown in Edinburgh Street were related to the pipe work and we're going to get on with that. Um, we, are, we, we have an online lead monitor on its way from, from Belgium at the moment and that will provide 20 minute results. Those 20 minute results could be enough um, provided that the monitor provides the right level of um, resolution and, and the right confidence. We should be able to look at um, options to get the water supply back on soon um, and give the community confidence that um, if there is a lead spike from the river or, or elsewhere that we can um, uh, ensure that it doesn't make it to your taps. Uh, in the meantime, water tanks will remain in the same locations um, until that local supply returns and we, we're committed to doing that. Um, and options to restore safe drinking water more broadly are also being considered. We have a work stream considering considering broader infrastructural options than just those short term ones I described before. Uh, I'll just close again by thanking you all for your patience um, and um, looking forward to um, the next opportunity to share our progress. Thank you, Tom. Now we're going to welcome up our uh, panelists now. If they could just come up and take the take your seats, and then we'll just uh, introduce them once they're seated. And we're going to have question time. Now this is a large hall, and the acoustics are such that it's not easy for people up here to hear people out there unless they're using a microphone. Now Andy Barrett here in the fluoro vest is going to be wandering around with a wireless microphone. And so when it's your turn to ask a question, just advise your name, what area you live in, and then ask your question. Now when you're using a microphone, please hold it up as if you were licking an ice cream. But don't lick the microphone. Right? It's no good whatsoever holding a microphone way down here or away you need to hold it close to your mouth. Now I know it's tempting sometimes to shout out from the audience, boo, rubbish, or whatever from there, but there's not much point in that because up here they can't hear what you're saying. So please just do be patient and wait until Andy has given you the microphone. Now just to introduce who we've got here, 
We've got Andy Pearson from MPI, and we've got to thank Andy for coming all the way down here. Thank you very much. We've got Adam Pomerlow, our poison specialist. Then we've got... Oh. Eh? I know. Gloria Dente, our pediatrician. Who have we got there? Oh, Michael Butchard's here. Susan Jack, you know. Tom, you know. And we've got Sandy Graham along there. We've got Aaron Hawken. Simon Drew, up from the end, is uh, one above Tom in the hierarchy of the council. Then we've got Richard Saunders, the compliance manager from the regional council, and Andrew Noon, who's the chairman of the regional council. There's your microphone, Andy. It will be for you slide that way, not be up when you see the lights. There you go. Okay, we're just going to put microphones on the desks here. There will be microphones here so that those who are answering questions can pass the microphones around. So there's the first one. Hi, I'm Brian Anderson from Beach Street. Uh, could anyone tell me, is it possible that the exaggerated lead readings that we got were the result of either a faulty test or an incompetent tester. They appeared to be exceedingly high one day and virtually nothing the next. That doesn't seem to fit very well with normal scientific ex explanations. Uh, thank you. Um, that, that is a, um, a line of inquiry that we are following. Um, however, it's very difficult to prove um, with the way that we were testing. Um, we, we weren't holding spare samples um, for retesting, so we can't go back and look at those again. Um, we, we are doing that now, so wherever we get a high result, we'll be able to validate. Um, we were, we're also um, taking an approach that is that we're going to treat those samples as being real samples until we can prove otherwise. So without the ability to prove it, um, we'll try and eliminate every other possible cause by investigating really closely. The reason we do that is um, that's a precautionary approach that, that is required to ensure that we can demonstrate to you as a community that we're taking your public health seriously. Hi, um, Albert Rehberger. I live on Beach Street. Uh, thank you, Tom, for the explanation. It was very useful. There was one thing missing. What's going to happen next? One, what sort of time frame can you give for this water tapping out of containers? I mean, are we doing this all winter? Is there? Have you got any cutoff dates? I mean, any information? Uh, yes, yeah, so we. <laughs> Things are still a little bit uncertain. Um, we're still in the process of um, completing that investigation, and at this stage, we, we just don't know what we don't know. Um, but um, we're, we're hopeful that uh, within two to three months, once the pipeline in Edinburgh Street is replaced, and once our um, online monitors are in place and functioning properly, um, that we should be able to um, start looking at um, lifting that do not drink notice and, and uh, reinstating the supply. I'm Ruth Ferguson, I'm from a white way to here, about two blocks away. Um, my question really relates uh, to the DCC because I noticed that 30% of people were not drinking the local water. I think there is a real problem here. Um, I haven't drunk it for three years because um, the t it was often tainted in summer. Um, I would call it like mud, but um, I also used to get quite heavy precipitates and um, some of them were so bad that I was trying to get to work in the morning and I couldn't use water to make a cup of tea, so I ended up buying a distillation unit. Um, I think long term there is a real problem with the water here, irrespective of the lead problems at the moment. I'd like to know what is going to be done about it.
Thank you for the question. It's one we've heard often over a number of years. Uh, and in the, in the next year of our current 10-year plan, which rolls over on the 1st of July, we have money uh, in the budget to upgrade the water treatment facility in Waikawaiti, so that was already planned work. Uh, at, at the moment, though, given everything else uh, that's going on, it's, it seems uh, timely for us to look at whether what we were planning to do that was adequate for the issues that have arisen since then. Uh, but that was that was already in our in our plans for the next financial year to, to upgrade the, the water treatment plant of that bike waiting. I've had so many people say to us actually that the tap water, I mean the water we're getting from the tanks tastes so much better than the water we've had previously. Why can't we have the same supplies to meet the double A grade? Um, so the upgrade that uh, Mayor Hawkins referenced before will address the taste and odour issues um, that, that you described. Um, so you'll have a after that upgrade, you would likely have a completely different tasting um, uh, water from the same source, but just treated through through a different process. So that would result in a really similar aesthetic to the the, the water you had through the tanker. Okay, my name's Clyde Doubleday. Um, we've seen a lot of people up here with a lot of um, figures after their name, or letters after their name. I'm not skiting here, but I have a diploma for graduates from the Department of Social and Preventive Medicine. We've been shown a lot of graphs and everything like that. Now, I asked the Mayor last time if he'd notify the um, WorkSafe regarding the um, issue of uh, us being exposed to lead, which he's duly done. Now I'm going to ask the CEO of D uh, the DCC, do you have, are you the officer of the DCC? Are you an officer of the DCC? I'm asking you a question. Under the Health and Safety in the Workplace Act 2015. Oh, yes, I understand your question. Okay, so you you have a duty of care and you have a, a, a duty of um, due diligence, is that correct? I understand my obligations under the health and safety. Yes, OK, thank you. How long have you known about this lead in um, our water? I was advised about 12 hours before the do not drink notice was issued. So, it's, so what's going on in the DCC that you've been kept in the dark since July concerning lead in the water? I'm not going to answer that question here. We've, I've signalled um, previously in numerous publications that our primary focus at the minute is resolving the issues. Of course it is, of course it is. And then I will look um, into what has led to this at the appropriate time. So you haven't started an investigation into this? Thanks, and, and I appreciate the same, you asked the same question last time, and I, and I made that commitment that Council would conduct an independent yes. review of its processes uh, leading up to the do not drink notice. Subsequent to that, uh, the Ministry of Health uh, announced that they were doing uh, a similar piece of work and that work is ongoing. Uh, and the results of that, when they are reported back, uh, will inform uh, what, what we need uh, to do remaining uh, to get a better understanding of uh, what happened internally and what processes need to change uh, in the lead up to the issuing of that notice. That's why, that's why I asked the question whether you had notified under section 24 or 25 of the Health and Safety in the Workplace Act. Have you notified WorkSafe? And you said yes. What is their reaction to that? I, I spoke with WorkSafe, um, so it wasn't a notifiable event. Um, from WorkSafe, so I spoke to, I'm sorry, I forgot the gentleman's name. We went through the web form um, and uh, we advised that it's not a notified event. Why am I asking that? Is that, um, <coughs> sorry? No, no, I'm an uh, ex prosecutor under the Health and Safety Employment Act. So that's why I'm asking the, these questions. If we suffer any, any um, problems 
from this lead in the, in the water. The only way we can get any reparation is actually we take DCC or the department, uh, sorry, WorkSec takes the department, the DCC to court. I'm asking for. Sorry, I can't hear you from here. Well, get Why do you think I'm barking up the wrong tree? Yeah. Why? Old Clive. Um, I, I just want to know. Independent, an independent inquiry into them. Yes. No. Clive, we mentioned earlier that the, they are doing a review, and on Monday I spent an hour and a half talking to the investigators from the health department. Uh, the, just a moment. I spent an hour and a half talking to the people who are doing the investigation from the health aspects. They're speaking to council, they're speaking to the health people, and as the CEO just spoke about, and the, the mayor, they are doing a review, and the whole review will be made public when it is done. And talking about prosecuting and all the rest of it, there's not much point in doing that until we know some more detail. So that is all going to be made public. I spoke with council on the 10th of February, I think it was, at a meeting, and I stressed to them that one thing that is totally required with all of this is complete transparency, all the councillors have taken that on board and it will happen. It's not going to happen tonight, Clive, but it will happen. And you get my assurance of that. Thank you. Um, my name's Dan Waikowiti. Uh, my question was to do with the <coughs> possible correlation between hexa, hexafluorosilicic acid, the category 8 industrial waste poison that comes from China, and it's got uh, contaminants of lead, arsenic, mercury, all sorts in it. Is there any correlation between the fluoride and the spiking of all these heavy metals? I know it's not about fluoride, but it's the chemicals that are use the fluoride. Negative ion, positive ions, they get exacerbated. My question is, what are the fluoridation levels? Are they above zero, 0 0.7 is a safe level. Are they above that or not? So within the white body drinking water supply, we, we don't dose fluoride at all, so we don't add fluoride to this water supply, um, we do within town. The naturally occurring background levels of fluoride in the, in the rock and natural environment within the um, Waikoweti catchment are around 0.2, um, uh, and yeah, that's probably the answer to the question. Yeah, my name's Nigel, I come from Karatani. Hey, um, you glanced over the fact of the Cherry Farm landfill. What you failed to mention was that the water treatment plant is literally right on top of the thing. Are you testing for any other companion chemicals that could be coming from there, as in pesticides, herbicides? Because that landfill would have been used in a time before it was sealed properly with an impermeable layer. So, you know, is that leaching into the, into the water treatment plant? Yes, yeah, so that, um, that landfill's been a um, reasonably significant feature in our investigation. Um, that we've included a whole bunch of test results from the environment around it uh, and uh, observations around the, the landfill itself. Um, what we found is that we, we haven't found any background levels of leaching, um, we haven't found any significant levels of leaching of any metals from that site. Um, and you are correct, the, the treatment plant is on top of it, um, but it's unlikely that we're getting any any contamination from that source based on our investigations so far. Hello, I'm Jan Bills, I'm a GP locally, and um, we've had some, I'd like to hear from our paediatrician, because we'd love to hear about breastfeeding and lead. Um, we've had a lot of concerned mums and I'd just love to 
hear what you have to say. Yeah, um, thanks for the question. It's certainly something we were considering when we were seeing the um, children that came through to our service. Um, and yet, it is a concern, obviously, if, if mum has high levels. Um, so that's something that we looked into with any of the testing that we had. Um, but um, in the individuals that we saw, that wasn't a concern. Um, and uh, uh, in all of the cases that we've um, had come through, that hasn't been something something that um, has been an issue. Um, so that hasn't been, um, it's certainly something we looked into and made sure it wasn't an issue. And nobody that's had any um, levels that has been a problem, um, that's been an issue. But certainly that's something that we considered very carefully. I'll just add to that that um, international guidelines would suggest that when the mother's blood lead level is around 1.9, you continue breastfeeding up until that level. And so we're talking about levels that are well below 1, and the overall risk-benefit analysis of breastfeeding would be far outweighed and good as opposed to the risk of harm from the low levels of lead. Very cool, Carter. Lana Poelis from Karatani. A uh, question for the gentleman from MPI. What would be your advice to any gatherers of kaiawa or food from the natural food from the river or, or the estuary going forward? Is it safe? Okay, so um, if, you, if you're going out and recreationally catching your, your kaiawa or your kaiwana, um, I mean, it, it's not a commercial food, so we don't test it for any safety. So there is an inherent level of risk associated with it, um, particularly shellfish. Um, as we've seen, people who eat shellfish tend to have the higher lead levels. This is because shellfish just naturally filter out all the, all the sediment in the water, and that comes with some of the metals. Um, also picks up things like algal toxins. So it's, it's still, I mean, we, we acknowledge it's still important practice. People um, get a lot out of eating kaiawa and kaimana. And I think to, to do that safely, there are a couple of steps you can do. Um, so the first is uh, the lead likes to sit in the sediment in the rivers and estuaries. So if there's been a big rain event, it's going to stir all that up and potentially come through into the food chain. So you want to leave it a couple of days until the water's clear um, before you do that. Uh, you also want to avoid um, fishing or harvesting around any uh, sewage outflows or outflows in general or boat ramps because they might have higher levels of the, the chemicals around them. And then also just to look out for any warnings from MPI or from the council around biotoxins or spills because they inform you if there's going to be a risk with the, the shellfish or the tuna that you're getting from those areas. Um, just to add to that, um, as a part of our investigation um, uh, in conjunction with the IRC, um, we've looked at some uh, some shellfish and um, a wider sampling of, um, of uh, fish species within the within the river. Um, they will come back with levels that uh, are below. Um, so we had to have had some testing with some um, trace elements of different metals in them. Um, however, it's all come back below uh, food standards so far. Uh, kia ora, my name's Mark Ellis, I'm a Karatani resident. Um, I had about three questions. Um, you spoke about investigation sources with a number still to be investigated. Uh, which ones? Can you be more specific? When will you let us know? Next question. Testing process. Has this been done in our Karatani water tanks? Uh, third question. You spoke about lead monitoring coming in from Belgium. Again, Karatani water tanks. Uh, is that actually going to help us? I'm kind of punny. And uh, for the last little while, as we've been having really cruddy water, are you going to be charging us for our water rates? Uh, so to, to start that off, um, I'll, I'll try and do these in order. Um, so for, for, for 
members of the uh, community meeting that um, aren't aware, um, many of the properties in Katatani um, uh, receive water via a tank on their private property that um, we, we call that a restricted supply. Um, so they have two days of storage on their site. Um, we, we feed that with a, a, a triple feed of water. Um, th that was how the system was designed when it was built um, uh, and, and continues to this day. The, so there are tanks all around properties in, in Karatani that are um, still full of water and that has potentially been subject to lead at one stage or another. Um, and we're, we're committed to making sure that when, um, when we do get to a position where we can turn the water supply back on, um, that we will go through a process to, one, drain those tanks, two, test um, when they're refilled and make sure that the water is lead free. Um, and if it's not, look at um, then options to address that with, um, with each individual property owner. Um, each individual property owner will get contacted in the near term to, to work out how we'll do this with your property. Um, certainly support you through that. Um, so with uh, so what what we what you were referencing there is um, a we, we bought an online lead monitor um, from a, um, a company that manufactures them in Belgium. Um, it's we believe it's um, the, the only or will be the only online lead monitor and water supplies in New Zealand. Um, we so we don't yet have local, um, you know, really clear local confidence or understanding um, of that instrument, but we'll be looking to install it in the next few weeks, um, and then and then gain that confidence and understanding by testing alongside it for a period of time, um, and then we'll use that to, well, hopefully, provided that all goes well, we'll use that to um, uh, to uh, ensure that we can supply safe like drinking water in the future. Uh, so in terms of the, in, in terms of our investigation so far, um, we have covered a broad range of things. There are a few things that we haven't yet been able to rule out, um, uh, and they are typically environmental, and they, they haven't been ruled out because they are hard things to rule out um, and require a little bit more work. Um, so one is um, the influence or the risk posed by um, some of the activities within the catchment. Um, one of those being uh, one of those being the mine. Um, the other, um, uh, the others, uh, some other potential sources of discharge, like fly tips within the um, within the catchment. But we're, we are working towards um, rolling those things out as, as quickly as we can, um, and, and trying to be as thorough as we can without potentially quite complicated sources. I get to give the unpopular answers. At this point, there's been no consideration of whether there'll be um, any rates changes because we're still supplying water, albeit in a um, less than ideal way, through the tank system. Thanks. Um, that's Jim O'Malley. I've got a question for um, Dr. Jack and, and the scatter data that was shown and your commentary on the paediatric lead levels and, and the statement that they were slightly higher. Um, what statistical analysis was done, or was there a statistical analysis done on comparing those two populations between the historic set and what we have here at White Way? Thanks, yeah, so we did do statistical analysis and yes, they were statistically different. Um, but like I said, there could be reasons for that, one of which could be seasonality for the, the children, and we're still looking at that. And as I also said, we don't have really good data sources in New Zealand. We have none for the zero to five years to compare with, um, and we only have one study that was done a few years ago um, with a relatively small sample size for the children five to nine years. So that's why we've been very upfront and said we can't rule out that they are slightly higher than what we expected, um, but there is seasonality, there are other exposures to take into consideration alongside the water. Uh, kia ora, uh, Lisa here um, from Wakawaiti, relatively new resident. Um, I just want to know if I can use my dishwasher yet. 
Hopefully that's an easy question. Kia ora. Uh, yes, you can use your dishwasher. You can use water for cleaning, uh, and that is uh, safe. And when things dry, when cutlery and plates dry, they wouldn't be a um, risk in terms of uh, consuming lead from that. Like Mike Perkins, Beach Street. At the last meeting, I asked, would a good water filter remove lead from the water? And I think the answer was, I doubt it. Well, I contacted two water filter companies, and they have stated that their water, a good water filter will remove 96% of the lead. So who is correct? Can we filter out? Can we not? Uh, there are commercially available filters that could um, uh, provide a level of assurance that they were uh, that lead was any lead within uh, our supply was removed. Um, they they do need to uh, adhere to a certain standard, and the standard uh, bathes me uh, right at the present point. But there's an, there's an Australian New Zealand standard, I believe, and there's also an American standard that um, uh, relates to the filtration of lead. Um, so if you were to purchase one of those filters, um, it would be really important to um, uh, to ensure that it meets those standards. Kia ora koutou katoa, Manu Hunter. <coughs> Other than Lake Waiiri. So my question is for Dr Susan and it's around uh, your presentation. So. We've seen some graphs that clearly show that before the time period which we were instructed not to drink the water, that there were some spikes, which evidently means that some people were drinking the water during that time. Uh, however, in your presentation, and I know this from a few people when they were filling out the form, what they were afraid of is that if they put down that you know they were doing renovations or something else, you know there was this anxiety that, oh, they're just going to use that information to, you know, to rule out the fact that water was, you know, a possible reason for why their lead levels were higher, which, you know, which I can understand the anxiety in that space. Now, in your presentation, you sort of mentioned quite a few of those other possible factors, which I imagine, which I remember being the questions that were put on the form. And, you know, but not once did you mention the water being one of those factors. So are you saying that uh, considering the length of time before that, you know, before that notice came out and the charts that clearly show there were spikes in there, that the water, there was not any chance of that affecting the lead levels? Okay, I'm sorry if that's what you understood because that's not what I was saying. We were saying that the other risks look to be more important than water. We cannot rule out that there has been some small increase by in blood lead levels from the water. However, they were intermittent spikes um, and even with the highest spike, the contribution to someone's blood level would be relatively small. However, as we've also said, um, lead accumulates in the body, and so we expect it by doing the blood lead levels. If we had some signal that all of the people in the community had much higher levels than, for example, the national survey, we would be obviously very alarmed. We did not find that. However, we did see a slight increase for the five to nine years, and like I've said, we don't have anything to compare for the zero to five years. So we haven't been able to rule it out. What we are saying is that it doesn't look like it's been a major contributor to blood lead levels. And we're just taking the opportunity to remind people that there are many exposures that um, many of us haven't considered, myself included, that we may be being exposed to. So what we can do now is we've stopped the possibility of you getting lead through the drinking water by the do not drink notice. And now we're encouraging people to think about are there any other exposures that I should be taking into consideration for my own exposure to reduce whatever risks there might be. 
Kia ora, I'll just add uh, one other thing to that. We did have a question in there about drinking water, whether people brought in water from outside of town um, or whether they only drank water locally. And uh, Dr Susan Dad covered that question as well. So we did analyse on that and we couldn't find a difference uh, between the two groups. Um, now we are dealing with um, small um, samples, small numbers of people, um, but if there was an effect from that, our question couldn't draw that out. So we did look at it, did analyse it, but we couldn't find a difference. Um, my name's Judy, I'm from Wakawai. There is a difference. Um, my, my household, two of us are over 50, we have been drinking water from Dunedin for years because the water here tastes like and it's worse when it rains, it tastes even more gross. So I don't want my cups of tea that way. But um, we had neighbours who had just had a newborn baby. Our lead levels were low. Um, they were 0.056 and 7. Our neighbours who were drinking the local water here had lead levels um, of 0.1, etc. And their baby had 0.1. So um, what I'm wondering, because it concerns me, is there a sliding scale for children or are we all lumped in with that same, um, you know, the, the 0.24? Is it surely if a child's only, you know, a few grams compared to <laughs> an adult, what, is, is there a sliding scale or is it, does it go per litre of blood? Can that just be explained a bit more for parents? Because, I mean, I'm concerned and they've been concerned for their baby. So I'm just thinking we haven't been drinking the water yet. They have. There is a definite difference in our levels and there's not a hang of a lot else. There are tons younger than us, obviously. So haven't had as much exposure. Sorry, I don't know if it's a very good question. I'm just trying to get this right in my own head. Sure, thank you for the um, comment and question. I'll have a go at uh, trying to answer what you're after, but let me know if it doesn't hit the mark. So we do take into account, you're talking about a sliding scale, so we certainly take everyone's particular blood result into the analysis. And the way that it is analysed is it looks at everyone's blood result and it compares that also with the factors for each individual. So whether you are in a particular house of a particular age or um, it also takes into account how old you are, um, whether you're a man or a woman, um, all of those questions are fed into the analysis. Uh, so it's certainly not as um, simplistic as uh, using those bands of just looking at who's over 0.24 or who's under 0.24. And when we try and answer those questions, the best way to answer them is to pull on all of the data, so all of those 1,200 data points, um, that's your blood lead levels, we put that all in, uh, and then the um, smart people at the ESR um, use that, they pull it into a model, and then that's how we um, get our answers. It's best to incorporate as much data as we can to answer those questions. talking about if a baby with a tiny little brain has got 0.1 of lead in their system compared to an adult having 0.1, what is the danger factor, you know? Thank you for the question. Um, a few points also within a household. So we're all getting, um, the community here has gotten a real fast crash course in, in lead which is a really complex physiologic thing to measure and understand because it moves into different compartments in the body and the exposure pathways are quite complex as well. And so individuals within the same household can have varying blood blood levels and you would, you would think that they have pretty much the same exposure but it can be quite different even amongst individuals in the family. And so for your specific question about what does a level of 0.1 in a child mean versus a level of 0.1 in an adult, it's really about risk of longer term effects. 
So for very young children, there are linked, there, the evidence would suggest that there are links to neurodevelopmental sort of effects at later points in their development. Versus adults, the risks we think about with a long-term risk are things like hypertension, um, potential renal effects, and outcomes around cardiovascular diseases are more linked. And so the higher, if you move from a 0.1 to a 0.2, your risk for those types of outcomes are a bit higher. Um, and so those are the health outcomes that we're concerned about that are different between a child and an adult. In part, there's a lot of others potentially as well, but those are some of the main ones. Yeah, I'm Richard Olson, the wife of Eddie. Um, Dr. Pommel, I just have a question for you. Um, you spoke a lot at the last meeting about the lead testing overseas, and then when sort of infants grow up to be seven or eight years old, those IQ scores dropping. Roughly, I just wanted to know roughly, do you know what these sort of um, lead levels were and how far back they were tracked um, for that to sort of happen? Thanks for the question. Um, so the question is about what sort of, what the, degree of effect kind of is over time. And so there's different estimates from different studies. And you have to look at individual studies to see, because they're all slightly different in their methodology about when they test, when they follow up, what specific score range they were looking at, because there's different sorts of intelligence tests as well and different measures. And so some tests have found effect sizes of, you know, a decrement or a decrease of a point or two. And I think the highest range I've seen was maybe a, um, up to six points, but depending, that's I think with a doubling of the lead, you know, compared with the, the different population or the different people being tested. Um, and so overall, you know, we don't want to lose any IQ points, of course, um, but most studies have shown pretty small effect sizes over that sort of development. And then there's, a, yeah. Um, and I think it's important to remember also with any of the effects that they see from um, lead, that the effects are very um, individual, uh, different between different individuals. It's hard to predict what effects will be seen, and that's why um, when we see people affected by lead, we follow them over time, because um, we're one person that's got a, a level of um, 0.25, um, may, you may see some effects, and another person, um, you see nothing at all. Um, and um, the things that are reported in the literature are um, what is seen in a, in a group of people. Um, so um, for any effects that are reported, um, that's um, reported for a, for a group, and you, and you have to remember that um, some individuals you may see a lot of effects and others may um, have nothing at all. Um, and that's why for um, any of the individuals, the children that we've seen will be following over, over time. Um, to monitor their effects. Um, and for any of the individuals um, that had lower levels, we would recommend um, just monitoring their development like you would any child. Um, so for the lady in the back that was um, worried about her neighbour with a, a level of 0.1, um, obviously the um, parents will be monitoring that child's development like they normally would. Um, and if there are any concerns with that child's development, um, I expect that they would be um, referred through like they normally would um, for concerns with, with development, um, um, as would any child in the, in the community. Yeah. Um, I'm Judy Martin, the Chair of Power, our local community organisation. And while you're all here, I'd just like to say Thank you very much for all the work that you've put in since this crisis first developed. <laughs> I'm a fan of the, um, the L.V. Martin um, philosophy. It's the putting right that counts. And since the few sort of, you know, since it happened, I think you've all been very tireless um, in your efforts. Um, I'd just like to remind the community that um, this was a very localised crisis that um, happened just to us and we've had a huge amount of resources put into us. If there's going to be another crisis that happens, it might be a much wider one and we might be on our own. So if you're interested in that, that at all and getting ready for it, come to the meeting tomorrow night about getting an emergency response together.
Good luck at me. <laughs> I'd just like to ask the panel, especially the first speaker tonight, who, who outlined the blood testing system, if I pick this up right, our blood tests here were below the national average that we talked about. I think I'm correct in saying that. And so what I'm asking is, if we all, if we all had a blood done or a big number that we did get done, we're down where we should be in relation to our wherever the point was. Why are we so concerned about not using the water? Because we've been drinking that water since way before December when the high count came through. They've never mentioned another high count. So obviously the water has been where it is at the present time. So it, it hasn't really affected our health in relation to our blood count. So I'm wondering why there's so much concern about not drinking water as it is. Thank you. Okay, thanks for that question. Um, so listen, we've taken a precautionary approach. Um, as soon as we found out that the, the water lead levels were high, um, in the raw water in the reservoir and that might possibly be impacting the whole community. Of course we need to stop people from drinking that water in case there was further risk. A lot of investigation has gone on and as you've heard um, the council has been unable to determine what has caused those previous spikes but we're not going to be able to let you drink the water again until we can be completely assured that there's no, not going to be any ongoing risk of lead in the water that may impact. We're um, extremely pleased that the results are not showing by and large that there has been an effect from the water. Um, however, like I said, it's a precautionary approach and we want to leave no stone unturned to, to get to the bottom of this, to find out and make sure that you as a community have safe water to drink. Um, hello, uh, thank you for being here to answer all the questions I have. My name is Francisco, I live in Caritán, sorry, in Waco in Thomas Street. Um, my question is quite simple. The new instrument that's going to control the quality of the water, going to measure the lead level before to supply the water or after that? I'm doing the question because we know the result of the quality of the water after a few days. Actually, we drank the water that we are discussing now, okay? So that is why I want to know if we can trust, uh, we can trust uh, about the water before to supply it, before to take in the tap, or after to drink it. Thank you. Uh, thank you, it's a good question. So we will be installing that monitor um, on the uh, raw water side of the treatment plant, which is effectively the water we take directly from the river. Um, and we'll be testing prior to it going into the raw water reservoir. Now that reservoir has about two days of supply. Uh, so, so what we would look to do is, uh, if we did get a high result from the river at any one point in time, um, we should get that result within 20 minutes um, of uh, 20, 20 minutes of that result landing, and we should be able to turn that water out and back into the back into the river very quickly. Um, that'll mean that the, any lead containing water from the river um, wouldn't make it to any consumers, wouldn't make it to your taps. Hi, Chelsea, Michael E. G. Um, well, I understand that the difference in the children's levels. Uh, quite possibly not statistically significant. Uh, the question I have is, is there any thought to any risk factors from either of the schools or to big steps, being as those are the two, well, three, if you include Karatani School, places that our children spend a lot of time that we adults don't.
So I do know that um, our staff have visited um, the preschool uh, in the same way that um, some of you, um, our staff would have visited your homes and they've conducted um, their assessment to look for um, any hazards, uh, any sources of lead exposure. Um, what they usually test for, they look at uh, paint, uh, they often take dust samples and soil samples. I'm not sure um, which of those samples they took at um, that size, and certainly they would have been looking at the paint. Um, I'm not sure about the school, I can check um, on that um, and get back to you. Um, so yeah, we certainly are looking at those things. And in terms of um, yeah, the differences between um, the children of uh, this community and the national study, um, for certain ages there may have been um, a significant difference. It's uh, small and it is hard to determine um, why that is and we are, um, as uh, Dr Susan Jack explained, we just have that one study uh, to compare to, which was also a small study. Uh, so we're just a bit limited in what we can tell and what we can do from just those two uh, studies. Mark Brown, a member of the Community Board. Um, I have just a couple of questions to ask for the um, infrastructure. I just um, I'm, would like to know what planning is going into the to the, the, the new piping. Um, looking is is the planning involving um, possible future developments, etc., or is it just replacing the old pipes? Um, the second question is, I understand this has been um, financed from the, um, from the maintenance contract. I'd like to know what effect that may have on other maintenance in the future, because it's been brought forward by a considerable amount of time. Uh, so to answer your first question, um, the pipe replacement will absolutely allow for any growth that's um, accounted for in the district plan um, and second, dis second generation district plan uh, in the industry area. It's something we do is just a matter of matter of course. Um, the other question around um, budget, um, this, this event will be treated as an overspend and will continue works as you would normally have expected um, across the city. Well, we seem to have exhausted the questions, and our two gentlemen from the regional council have been let off lately. They haven't had to answer anything. Oh, we've got one more up there, Andy. I'm looking to wrap up somewhere around there. Um, hi, I'm Jared. I'm a, a father of three at Merth. Um, now, I'm just um, my question is to the health experts in the room. Um, according to the um, WHO and the CDC. There is no safe lead level in uh, children's blood, um, so I'm just wondering why you keep battering around this 0.24 level, um, and yeah, are you just trying to underplay it, or? If I might take the first stab. Um, so. The international guidelines, um, CDC, WHO, they identify that in their units, five micrograms per deciliter, which is the same as the 0.24 micromoles per liter, as the level of concern, a threshold of concern, where you would start to do something a little bit different. The reason that you'll read, and it's accurate based on the evidence, that there is no safe level, is that there's no evidence when you measure it to the smallest degree you can, that it doesn't have some of those later on effects of putting people in a higher risk for those developmental milestones or for um, adults, those other sorts of out out outcomes we talked about with high blood pressure and such. So as far as has everybody able to tell with those small measurements, you can't say that there's no effect. And so when it comes to safety, you know, safety is, the, is this sort of concept that there will be no detectable harm whatsoever. 
And when it comes to lead, the evidence says that there is no threshold there. But these numbers we're talking about and the, the number of 0.24 being identified, that's the, the level where you would start to do something a little bit different as far as follow-up, think about what the sources of exposure are, more so than if you're below that threshold. So it's not a safety threshold, it's a threshold of where we start to think a little bit more, we gotta pay more attention here, and potentially even do something different. Any other thoughts? Yeah, no, I think that was a good explanation. Um, I guess it's, um, uh, I've worked in the area of developmental pediatrics for a long time. I've seen a lot of um, children with developmental issues and um, when we see children that have had a lot of trouble with their development, one, one of the things that we regularly do is um, check lead levels and that's something that we do globally for children that have um, issues with development. Um, not just when there's uh, been a total sector for high lead. Um, and um, uh, I've seen hundreds of children with troubles with their development, um, and um, I've never previously seen a child that's had issues with the development and had a, a high lead level before. Um, it, it, there's a lot of reasons. Can you hold the microphone higher, please? Sorry. Um, and it's, it's not previously come up that it's been due to, to high lead levels. There's a lot of um, reasons for troubles with, with development. Um, uh, I think it's important to remember that um, uh, um, troubles with development are, um, can be due to a lot of, lot of different reasons. Um, if your child is having difficulties with their development, we'd love to see them. Um, um, uh, but just because your child um, has lead levels does not high lead levels doesn't mean that they will um, have tr tr troubles with their development. Um, it, it's not um, an indicator for that, um, and um, it's just something to keep in the in the back of your mind. Yeah. And this from the um, the public health perspective, so. While um, we realise that leaders throughout our um, environment and that almost everyone will have some lead in their blood if we test for it, we do want to still have a threshold and everyone should and can look at various ways to reduce their uh, lead intake and Dr Susan Jack mentioned uh, many of those. But we actually want to contact people and go through that with them if they have a level of 0.24 or above. So that's another way. So there are general messages that everyone in the community should be doing. Um, one of those that we've um, heard today is the flushing of the taps, um, also um, cleaning hands, um, those sort of things. Um, but if we find someone with the level of 0.24, then someone from our unit will be in touch and will ask you questions just in case there's something else specific going on um, with you uh, and your community or your household that we can identify and help you with. Hello there. Is there somebody up there that can ask a few questions about our homegrown vegetables and our garden soil? Uh, yes, so I'm, I'm happy to field a few on homegrown veggies. So, um, well, what we see with the, the lead in the water, um, it doesn't actually, when, when you put it in your garden, it doesn't actually like being in the water, it rather stick to the soil and um, blend up in your in your veggie pots so, in the soil and on the dust. So when we when we look at um, veggies and, and which ones are at risk, it's typically uh, a bit closer. It's normally those that are either growing in the ground, like potatoes, onions, carrots, or very close to the ground. But actually, any lead there is usually on the surface. So a real simple step you can do is when you've harvested it. Just give it a rinse down. Um, something like a potato, you might want to give it a scrub with some water, but just wash that dust off. And that's a real simple way to remove any of the lead there. But it, I mean, with the water results we saw here, we didn't see there was a risk from those causing any problem for homegrown veggies. 